Greetings and salutations gamers, my name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to Dark Souls. Usually this is where I would welcome you to a challenge run, but today we're doing something a bit different. Less of a challenge and more of an... idea. When you make a character in any of the Dark Souls games, one of the first choices you're given is to choose one of the 10 starting classes. Now, almost everyone will tell you that this choice really doesn't affect much outside of the early game. Any class can become any build with the correct use of resources, which usually makes this decision seem much less important. But what if that wasn't the case? What if you had to play as what you picked all the way in the very beginning? What if you tried to beat Dark Souls as your starting class? And the questions I was most curious about, which class would be the strongest, and which one would be the weakest? To answer that question, I played through Dark Souls 10 times here live on the channel, and the results were actually pretty interesting. Some classes that I expected wouldn't perform super well ended up blasting through the game, and other classes suffered extreme disadvantages throughout the run. Before we get into any of that though, let's set up some ground rules on how we'll compare every class. First of all, I want to note that I'm not treating this as a strict challenge run. This is more so a test on how every class functions as a build, so the rules are a little loose for this video. To start off, we can only use the weapons, shields, armor, and spells that the class begins with. Weapons, armor, and shield, that's clear enough, but I really want to highlight the spell rule. For example, if we take the sorcerer, the only spell it gets in its starting class is Soul Arrow. As per the rules of this run, we will not be able to pick up any new spells besides Soul Arrow. This is going to make some huge differences on how things will shake up. What we will be allowed to use, though, are any rings in the game, any consumables, or any copies of an item that the class starts with. For example, we can have as many copies of the warrior's longsword as we want, so long as it's the same longsword that the warrior starts with. Equipment upgrades are 100% allowed, but nothing that changes the item we're using into a different item. So no boss weapons or ascended pyromancy flame on this occasion. And finally, no glitches will be allowed. As I alluded to earlier, all 10 of these runs we ran live here on the channel. If you're curious about any of the runs, or are in need of some background noise, I'll leave a link to the playlist with all the VODs in the description below. One last thing before we get started, if you enjoy this video or any of my other videos, it would be pretty neat if you did that subscribe button thing. And that's about it. I hope each and every one of you are having a wonderful day, and without further ado, here is Dark Souls Remastered as every single starting class. Before we get into any of the classes, let's talk quickly about building and pathing. While no two runs will be identical, all of them are going to be more similar than one may expect. One of the terms you'll be hearing a lot of in this video is AR, which stands for attack rating. I know it's a pretty commonly used term around the Souls community, but I've had a few people ask me during streams what exactly I'm talking about, so I'll go ahead and let Pass Me explain it so we're all on the same page. What is AR? AR stands for attack rating. So that is essentially after you factor in both scaling as well as the weapon level, the true amount of damage your weapon does. And I can actually talk about this real quick before we do gargoyles while I have a moment. So if you ever go to a weapon, Right now, you see it says 136 under mace plus 5. That right there is the base damage of the weapon. That is the amount of damage the weapon does, plus all of its upgrades. If I hit toggle display, you'll see that under physical, it says a, a 136. And then next to it, it says plus 70. Plus 70 is how much I'm getting from the scaling. In this case, it has a B in strength, which means I'm getting plus 70 damage from scaling. So, if we go to my stats page, you'll see um, in the middle column, one, two, three, four down, it says our weapon one, which is the amount of damage the weapon in my right hand is doing. It's at 206, which is that 136 plus the 70. So 206 is the current AR or attack rating of my weapon. Now you'll notice that if I two hand, it goes up to 243. 243 is because when you two-hand a weapon, it applies a, an additional 50% of whatever your strength level is. So right now, I'm at 27. It rounds down. So I'm getting an additional 13 levels of strength scaling to my attack. 
which now makes my AR 243. And that's kind of your lowdown on uh, AR and attack rating. For all of these runs, we'll be mainly focusing on upgrading our weapon to plus 15 through the standard path. This is for two reasons. Number one, standard path consistently has some of the best scaling in the game. And number two, standard path will allow us to use weapon resins based on the situation. There could be arguments to be made about which of the many upgrade paths is technically the most efficient for given situations in the game, but for the sake of consistency and not wasting everybody's time, we'll stick to standard. It's more than enough to clear the game anyways. For rings, there are a few options that are pretty strong. Every class will benefit greatly from the Ring of Favor and Protection. The bonuses it provides to health, stamina, and equipment load are actually enough to carry most classes well past in Orlando, which will allow us to focus more points into our damage stats. Ring slot number 2 is far more contentious. However, there are two rings that stand above the rest. The Chlorinthy Ring and the Wolf Ring. Chlorinthy Ring is easy enough to understand. Extra stamina regeneration is a powerful tool in just about every FromSoft game. The only other places we can gain passive stamina regen are through either the Grass Crest Shield or the Mask of the Child, both of which are outlawed by the rules of the run, which means this ring suddenly shoots up in priority. However, this ring's main strength does suffer from one tragic downfall. The fight where stamina regeneration is the most effective in the game is the Four Kings, but since that fight requires the Covenant of Artorias, it restricts our ability to have a second ring slot which means we would have to choose between Chlorinthy or having favor and protection for the rest of the run. The fight where the ring would shine the best tragically will never see use in these runs. But the wolf ring on the other hand is an absolutely underrated powerhouse of a ring. This ring can be found as early as Darkroot Garden and provides 40 poise. That number may not mean a lot to you, so let me put that number into context. That is the equivalent of equipping two Elite Knight chest plates, or just under the value of the entire Elite Knight armor set. The bonus poise is going to be super efficient against most bosses, letting us occasionally completely shrug off attacks from bosses as late as the DLC. That's about all the planning we need to do to tackle these runs. Let's focus on each run individually, and then we'll see how they stack up in the end. What do we reckon the best tasting non-human souls boss is? Covetous demon? Maybe. Okay. I don't know why my brain just did this, but my brain just told me that demons probably taste like catfish. Taurus demon is premium beef? True. Hey. Hold up. All right. Some y'all being nasty. Mytha. I don't know, I feel like that's still too close to human for me. Marinated in poison. True, you, if you were to eat, like, the snake part... What? Where did we go? <laughs> what is... How it started. Guys, I think I got sick. How it ended. So what would Quaylag taste like? The warrior, or Sir Dumpy as chat named him, is the first and potentially most basic class, and there's not much more to it. Early game, the damage of the longsword is good enough to clear out most of the bosses. One of the big tests early on is to be able to clear out the undead dogs in one hit, and the sword is just strong enough to do so. Evidently, that's pretty much how I would describe the experience of the longsword for pretty much the entire game. For most of the game, it's just strong enough to do exactly what you want it to do. It is possible to reach the higher damage numbers with this weapon by heavily investing in quality stats, reaching all the way up to 408 AR at 40 strength and dexterity. That being said, rushing to double 40s does come with some sacrifices, as you would need to run 32 endurance and the ring of favor protection in order to fast roll with the entire set. You could negate this by opting into Havel's ring. Even at the base level of just 12 Endurance, both Havel and Favor will boost you enough to fast roll. Granted, you will have to make some sacrifices for the Four Kings specifically, but that's not too bad. Although do keep in mind that while the Hard Leather set does have an okay amount of defense, it does lack substantial poise. This can pose some problems, especially during Capra Demon and ONS. 
Although the Heater Shield's 100% physical protection is a luxury that some other classes wish they had. Overall, the Warrior doesn't have anything interesting to look at. No point where it truly struggles, no point where it's exceedingly powerful, it's your average Joe class. And sometimes, that's not so bad. Ow. Ow! Well, there goes that Titanite shard. Not that I needed it, but... At least Press isn't here to pick on me this time. <laughs> Because I wanted the retrieval text to manipulate uh, the RG. God bless it. <laughs> Sir Pillwill, as chat decided to name, the knight is an interesting step after the warrior. At first glance, it doesn't seem too different. A fairly basic straight sword, a 100% physical block shield, and some fairly heavy armor you'll need to invest resources towards in order to get any kind of mobility. If anything, you may write it off for being at fat roll levels straight out of the gate. But when you take a second look, there's actually a lot of good stuff going for it. The broadsword is slightly lower range than the longsword, but its damage is just slightly higher than the longsword, reaching all the way up to 418 at 40 dex in strength. The knight armor is also, by far, the most amount of poise of any of the starting armor sets, and that makes a pretty huge difference later on in the game. Being able to shrug off some attacks from even Manus without the Wolf Ring makes the armor far more appealing than one might initially think. With all of that being said, even with the many pros, the Knight can't fully escape the cons. Once again, to reach the high numbers of damage, the Knight requires heavy investment into quality scaling. A total of 52 levels of investment on a plus 15 weapon in order to make it break the 400 line is a pretty hefty cost. And that's without factoring in the cost to escape the fat roll. If there's anything the knight is known for, it's being hungry for gaining levels. Oh my god, I got off the wall RNG. RNG. What in the world? Huh? What? Where'd he go? I sent him to the Shadow Realm. What the hell? The Wanderer is definitely the wolf in sheep's clothing. The first class to downgrade to light armor and one of the flimsiest shields in the game, the Wanderer doesn't seem like much at first. But never underestimate the curved blade of death it holds in its right hand. The Scimitar is a bringer of doom that I have completely forgotten about over my years in Dark Souls. The Scimitar is the first weapon that focuses a single stat, and it doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort to squeeze out disgusting damage from this death blade. With only a 26 level investment to reach 374 AR, this thing is nearly breaking the 400 AR line with so much less effort than other classes have to put in. But while it does have a bit less damage per swing, this curved monstrosity more than makes up for it in attack speed. And with the class's ultralight armor and shield, this class has much more flexibility in its rings than most of the classes do. Super fast, super flexible, with super damage. If you ever decide to play as the Wanderer, you're in for a wild ride. As a bonus fun fact, if you wield the scimitar in your left hand, you can parry with it. If you're fast enough, you can parry with the left hand and then change your scimitar back to your right hand before the parry ends to get the repost. So naturally, there was only one way Gwyn was dying this run. Got it! There it is! Get absolutely swagged on, you moron! Doesn't the bandit's knife become very cracked? Uh, I'll be honest... I don't have a lot of faith! <laughs> that damage. Damn it. God, the range on this thing is such a problem. <laughs> Come here. Bite me, you abyss-corroded bastard. 
where do I even begin with the thief? Especially right after the Wanderer was such a massive leap forward, now we're stuck with Stab's McCoy. The Thief has a neat gimmick that allows it to start with an extra gift since it gets the Master Key by default. While that's fairly neat, there really isn't much use for that. At all. The main reason you would be attracted to this class is for the bleed effect attached to the Bandit's Knife, and it just so happens that one of the bosses that's the strongest against is the Asylum Demon. So the Black Fire Bombs are pretty much out, and unless you really want Divine Blessings, this is a pretty useless gimmick. As far as the damage goes, the Thief is some of the most red light green light damage you will see in the base game. Ask yourself this question, does the boss you're hitting bleed? If the answer is yes, then congratulations, you'll probably be able to deal damage. If the answer is no, then I hope you enjoy the pathetically low 262 AR at 40 dex. That being said, the Thief does have a really neat advantage where it can kill the Stray Demon super early since it suffers from chronic bleed procs. Rushing the Stray Demon on Thief is actually pretty fun if you haven't tried it before. Could lead to some fun run ideas. Although by far the worst part of this whole endeavor is the DLC. Sanctuary Guardian wasn't the most miserable experience, but fighting Artorius as the Thief was by far the most difficult encounter in all 260 bosses from this marathon. If I wasn't as well practiced at Manus as I currently am, I imagine he'd be fairly close to the same level of miserable, and while Kalami can be bled, that's a very small win in the Thief's Court. There are some challenge runs I've done in the past that I would consider easier than some of the later encounters for the Thief. And while I wasn't considering this a challenge run, I still found myself treating Artorius as if it was one. Don't mind if I do. Ghostblade, do it. I... I can't even use it. I'm not even allowed to hold it in my hands. Axolotl the Bandit was the class I initially predicted would be the easiest one to clear the game with, and first impressions say that I wasn't far off. The Battle Axe is definitely one of the hardest hitting weapons available early on, and it's only a 32 level investment in order to get this thing above the 400 AR line. Although it should be noted that since this weapon is based on strength scaling, it benefits much more from two-handing than previous options, allowing us to crank this thing as high as 445 AR. This class does require a little bit of equipment load support in order to achieve fast roll, but not nearly as much investment as a knight or warrior. This means we once again get to be flexible with our second ring slot. And speaking of being flexible, the Spider Shield is once again a 100% physical protection shield that's a nice addition to the overall build. Add the fact that this weapon can be considered strong in pretty much every stage of the game, and you have a really solid class. The only true downside to this class is it doesn't really have a lot of special gimmicks. The Bandit is here to hit things really hard, and that's it. But in a game where your goal is to hit things until they die, you can't really ask for much more than that. Hey Ragnar, how you doing? Great X? Oh my god, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing that? I hate this game. The Hunter at first glance may look like it'll have a rough time. Equipped with a short sword and a short bow, if anything, it looks like it might be getting the short end of the stick. A 30 level investment only gets you up to 327 AR, and being at 40 strength and 40 dex settles just barely under the 400 line at 397. The shield that has okay resistances, this may seem at first glance that it's just the worst option amongst the quality builds. However, hope's not entirely lost. Given the short bow to start out with, this class does have some potential to pull off easier strategies that may be otherwise unavailable to other classes. With a bow, you're able to stunlock Quelag to death, have a much more reliable ranged option against the Moonlight Butterfly, can get a much easier method to skip the Ghost House, 
and even use the bow strategy for an easier bet of chaos. That's a lot more utility than a lot of people might give it credit for. The short sword may be dragged down by the quality scaling, but at the end of the day it gets the job done well enough to where it isn't too much of a hassle to play as this class. I don't think two-handing gives that much damage, if I'm being honest, so if we look... Oh. <laughs> Chat. <laughs> 66 AR. Oh, I hate. I hate. I <laughs> 67 if I do hand. In honor of the dagger only livestream I did a few years ago, we named the sorcerer Big Poke, the older brother of Lil Poke. Also, in honor of that run, we continued its tradition by struggling to do absolutely any form of damage. Early on, Soul Arrow can carry for a decent amount of the early game. The basic catalyst scales fairly well with intelligence and doesn't really get outshone until the Logan's catalyst makes its in-game appearance. If you know the strategy, you can even use it to stunlock Quelag to death. That being said, the damage of the basic Soul Arrow falls off super fast. With investment into intelligence, you can make the Soul Arrows work all the way through ONS, which isn't the worst case scenario. But once you get past the Lord Vessel midpoint, you're definitely going to want to swap into the dagger, as Soul Arrow begins to hit for pitiful amounts of damage. And while the dagger will perform a lot better than Soul Arrow, in comparison to the rest of the starting class weapons, it's abysmal. And contrary to common belief, the regular dagger does not receive extra damage in exchange for not having the Bandit Knife's bleed effect. At 40 dex, it hits for an identical AR of 262. And in case you're wanting physical proof as to why we use Dagger for the later parts of this run, here's Soul Arrow against Artorius. Use Soul Arrow? We can see what it's like. <laughs> Altogether, the Sorcerer has a poor shield, poor damage, and a very poor performance in the endgame. Hey Kyle, if you'll be doing this challenge for DS2, how bad do you think Deprived will be in that game? That won't be that, that bad, right guys? Deprived is gonna be fine. The club is just as good in every game as it is in this one. Is there something I'm missing? How dirty did they do the club? It's not necessarily that they did the club dirty in the other games. DS1 club is, uh, kind of cracked. Kyle, DS2 deprived doesn't get a weapon. Wait, really? Wait. Wait a second. Oh, no. When it comes to the Pyromancer, there's not as much here as you might think there is. Since we can't upgrade to the Ascended Flame, Fireball isn't necessarily going to hit for super large damage, but it's not exactly a bad spell at any point in the game. It may not have Sorcerer's ability to stun lock Quelag, but it can be a decent ranged option even past Ornstein and Smo. Although, even with the Fireball being minorly useful, this class sees a lot more power in its melee weapon of choice. While I didn't expect the Hand Axe to deal any decent damage, with only 28 levels of investment, it can quickly climb to 325 AR. It may barely break the 380 level at double 40s, but it has a surprisingly fast attack speed that helps make up for it. The mid game is really where this class shines. The damage at ONS is fairly surprising, and it continues to be consistently decent against most of the later bosses in the game. It does tend to fall off a little bit when it comes to the DLC, but not nearly to the point where you're struggling. We like that. Uh oh. Oh! Please. Please! No! No, 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 no! God! Cut the stream! Cut the recording! No! Cut the stream! Cut the stream! I 
lost the deathless run to pinwheel walking into the cleric i knew this was going to go one of two ways either the mace would be decent and this playthrough was going to be boring or the mace was going to absolutely slam everything we came across and after running the cleric i can strongly recommend this behemoth of a boss stomper after three shotting the first gargoyle, I already knew that this thing was going to be a powerhouse, but this thing never ceased to disappoint. It only takes 28 levels in strength in order to reach level 40, where this thing reaches a whopping 431 AR in one hand, or 443 in two hand. This thing slams all the way through the main game with massive chunks of damage, staggering the iron golem in a single strike. Not even to mention the absolute number this thing does on ONS. It's able to stagger Ornstein in two hits, and each hit takes off multiple bars of health. Even into the DLC, this thing still hits like a bus, easily knocking Artorius out of his buff and slamming through both Calamites and Manus' health bars. If it wasn't for the fact that my greed got me comboed to death at Pinwheel, the Cleric run would have been pretty casually a deathless run. Monster Hunter World video is that? It's just- No, 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 do not summon press. Do not tell him I died in the church again. Quit summoning him. He's busy. Oh, come on! Deprived is one of those runs that anybody who's new to the game probably observes with fear. Armed with only a stick and a wooden plank for a shield and completely devoid of any armor, this class may seem like it's a trap. But one must remember that the power of Oonga Boonga carries much weight in the world of Lordran, and the Deprived is no different. Early game, the club is an excellent source of damage. As long as you're keeping up with upgrades, it pretty reliably one-shots most basic enemies all the way through Sen's Fortress. As far as the mid and late game go, the club at 40 strength gets up to 387 AR. It may not break the 400 mark, but with only 29 levels of investment to get there, it's a much cheaper alternative than most of the quality scaling options. Bosses like Iron Golem and ONS take a surprising amount of damage, and the rest of the base game at plus 15 is pretty comfortable to deal with. When it comes to the DLC, the damage is somewhat comfortable. Nothing special, but definitely enough to get the job done. While the Deprived may seem scary, having to tackle the game without armor or a reliable shield, as long as your roll timings are fairly on point, the damage from this class is more than enough to carry you. Every class has its ups and downs, and to be honest, ranking these isn't as easy as it may seem. While there are certainly some classes that are definitively at the bottom, and some that are pretty definitively at the top, the gap between each individual class is so small it's pretty hard to quantify. Given how close the rankings are, instead of a top 10, we're going to sort these into a tier list. This will show the ease of difficulties much better as we get through the list. Let's do this. Starting at the bottom with D tier, we have the Thief and the Sorcerer. Both of these classes have a gimmick which can be pretty strong in the early game that can lead to a boss being done earlier than some of the other classes can comfortably do. Thief's Bleed lets you rush the Stray Demon with pretty comfortable damage, and with just a little bit of investment, the Sorcerer can stunlock Quaylike to death fairly easily. Those same resources, Bleed and Soul Arrow, are actually fairly nice to have at different points in the game. However, Neither of these two gimmicks are going to carry the class through everything, and while the dagger and bandit's knife are okay weapons at times, their lack of meaningful damage against DLC bosses makes for a really terrible time. These are the only two classes amongst the ten that I would consider having an actively hard time at any point in the game. Moving up to the C tier sitting by itself is the warrior. The warrior's armor is better than most of the other options, and with a lot of stat investment, it can get itself above that 400 AR line. Outside of that though, there really isn't anything truly special about this class. You aren't doing yourself a disservice as playing the warrior, but you're definitely in for one of the most mediocre experiences you can have in Dark Souls. 
Sitting in B tier are the Pyromancer and the Hunter. This tier was by far the hardest for me to create. The Hunter I initially had in C tier with the Warrior, but after going through the run a few times, I couldn't consciously put them in the same relative placement. While the Short Sword may lack damage early on, its scaling does make a credible threat in the late game. But to make up for that early game damage is the Short Bow, a tool that can be used in a number of places throughout the game. It's potentially the strongest range support of all the classes in DS1 if you bother to put upgrades into it. The Pyromancer's situation is pretty similar. Fireball also makes for fairly decent range support, and the Hand Axe has a surprising amount of scaling damage that helps it carry throughout the game. Neither of these classes have a primary weapon that will surprise you with massive damage, but they both have enough support to make them clear the game a bit more comfortably. Surprisingly enough, a tier is the fattest of the list. It consists of the Deprived, the Bandit, and the Knight. Bandit and Deprived are in a very similar boat. They don't necessarily have any special gimmicks, but the focus on strength scaling on both their weapons mean they climb into the higher damage numbers much faster than the rest of the classes. Of the two, I personally prefer the Bandit, who hits harder and, in my opinion, has a much better moveset. However, Knight also creeps his way into A tier for a very different reason. While it does take a fair amount of resources, being able to fast roll in his full armor set makes for a very casual experience. He has the ability to be fast and somewhat tanky with the armor's inbuilt poise, and while the broadsword may not be the most effective weapon in the 10 classes, it is definitely more than enough to get the job done. Overall, the A tier is a set of classes that can comfortably clear the game without much issue. There's no point in the game where any of them feel weak, but they aren't quite strong enough to rival the power of the S-Classes. And of course, the S-Tier. The Wanderer and the Cleric. These are the death machines of Dark Souls 1. While neither of these classes have any kind of real range support or defensive options, the amount of damage that these two can output far exceeds the need for it. This tier can simply just be the Scimitar and Mace tier, two weapons that are easily able to shred the game. The scaling on these two weapons are monstrous, requiring less than 30 levels of investment to reach endgame levels of damage on both weapons. Scimitar is the DPS machine, being able to speedrun health bars with its combination of high AR and attack speed, and the Mace is a whacking stick of enemy deletion that just takes out chunks of everything it touches. Relative to the other starting classes, both of these classes go far beyond being just good. I would consider these two classes viable, nearly complete builds. There are very few changes I would make to either of these classes if I had the chance to make them as effective as possible. If you're looking for a fun way to blast through Dark Souls 1, give either of these two a run. As long as you're keeping up with upgrades, then enjoy absolutely breezing through the game. As one final note before we conclude today's video, we have to address one important detail that I've neglected to tell you all. Easily one of the most important aspects of this entire challenge. Alright chat, you know the drill, what mask is it? Alright chat, you know the drill, you got 20 seconds to tell me what you think this mask is. Alright chat, you know the drill, what mask is it? If you guess correctly, you get to brag to everyone else who got it wrong. 10 pinwheel kills, 10 pinwheel masks. Every time we killed pinwheel on stream, we had everybody try to guess what mask was going to draw. So if you want to play in this game one more time, then go ahead and guess now what mask dropped the most during our starting class runs. Let me know in the comments if you get it right. Here we go. Also, child. Damn it. Pressing that button in three, two, one. Ah, it was father for once. All right, three, two, one. Child. I think we've gotten all of the uh, the masks now. All right, we got three, two, one. Mask of the father, it's a blessed run. Pick it up in three. Two, one, mother. If you picked mother, you were correct. 
We're going to see who's right in five, four, three, two, one. Child day. Everyone who said child, you were correct. Also, the best mask in the game. All right. In three, in two, in one. It is the father. Blast run. Three, two, one. Father, go to run. All right. In three, two, one. Mother. Anybody who ga guessed mask of a mother, congratulations. You guessed correctly. You get bragging rights to the rest of the chat. All right. Mask in three, two, one. It was, in fact, Mask of the Father. I'd call this run blessed if it wasn't so freaking cursed already. <laughs> Child in last place with two drops, Mother with three drops in the middle, and Father being the one to come in first with five drops. Half the runs blessed by the Mask of Daddies. And there you have it. Dark Souls Remastered beaten as every starting class in the game. These 10 runs have been an absolute blast to play with all of you who came to watch. Between getting to just hang out with new people, and getting to hang out and have fun with all my fellow creators who came to every stream, I've never felt more connected to this community than I do right now. Whether you're a VOD watcher or somebody who catches the streams live, you have all made these runs far more amazing than they ever could have been if I just sat down and recorded them. But if you missed out on the streams, and you want more streams, then don't you worry, because we are far from done. Last time I checked, there's 10 more starting classes in Dark Souls 2. And 10 more in Dark Souls 3. And 10 more in Elden Ring. And another 10 in Demon Souls. We've got at least 40 more classes to go across 4 more games, and I hope I get to say hi to each and every one of you at least once. I try to stream every Friday sometime around 3 p.m. CST. It's not an exact time, but if chat knows me for anything, it's being late. But that's gonna do it for me today. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up, bop that subscribe button, and ring a tingling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description below to come chat and hang out with me and the rest of the community. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later!